Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CMA and CMO Weekly Webinar Series. I'm Jackie Lewis, VP of Content here at ARC, which is the parent company of the CMA and CMA, and I am going to be uh, your host for today. So most of us know that we shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but approximately a third of consumers judge products by their packaging. Packaging is prime real estate for communicating your brand, mission, vision, values, and unique selling points. And today we are joined by Alice Warren, VP of Consumer Intelligence at Thinks, and Katie Emerson, Senior VP of Customer Success at Suzy, for a discussion about how Thinks taps into consumer insights to get the most out of their claims packaging. So as you have any questions for Alice or Katie, please feel free to enter those in the chat box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen at any time, and we'll get to those at the end, or I believe Katie will also weave them into the conversation as she sees fit if anything com comes in that is particularly relevant as uh, the conversation is going. And then finally, we will also be recording the presentation today. So if you miss something, don't worry, we'll be posting it in our resource library for all CMA and SEMA members early next week, and we will send you a note when it's there. So with that out of the way, welcome, and I will hand it over to you both to introduce yourselves in a little bit more detail. Fantastic, thanks, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Mastering the Art of Successful Claims packaging for those who I haven't met on a previous webinar. I'm Katie Emerson, Senior Vice President of Customer Success at Suzy. And for anyone who may not be familiar with Suzy, we're an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that integrates quant, qual, and high quality audiences into a single connected research cloud. And so as Jackie mentioned in the title, today's chat is going to be all about developing and testing claims packaging for products, and as we're having our discussion, I know she mentioned it before, but in case you missed it, just please feel free to drop the questions in the box on your screen and we're gonna answer them throughout the conversation and hopefully have some time at the end to get to all your burning questions as well. Um, I am super excited though uh, to introduce and have a chat here with Alice Warren. She is the Vice President of Consumer Intelligence at Thinks and she's gonna share her expertise with us today. So Alice, before we kick into the discussion, I would love if you could just tell the group here a little bit about yourself and your background. Thank you so much, Katie. I'm so excited to be here and um, participate in the call today and hear everyone's questions and really just talk about our consumers. So super excited. Um, so I've been at Thinks um, for four years. I was uh, early on in the process as the brand was growing um, and I've, I've loved it. You know, I've kind of moved into different roles within the organization. I, I started an experience, so really working with the end, um, end user directly, um, dealing with, you know, post purchase questions, things like that, and then have morphed into a, a broader role, really looking at the full consumer journey, uh, you know, tying in insights, figuring out what our consumers need, figuring out what they want from our brand. So it's really been an exciting journey um, with the brand so far. And my background is is a lot different. I have a very varied background. I started in architecture um, a long time ago, and um, so I was a, uh, you know, doing a lot of visual stuff, some model building, and then you know I, I did that for a little bit, enjoyed it, and then kind of segued into tech. And um, I spent about ten, almost like ten or so years doing that um, for various companies in New York. And I, you know, I was ready for a change and, and things came up and I was just excited to have my LinkedIn change from tech to fashion. And, you know, it was, it was history after that. So it's, it's been a really rewarding experience and I've learned so much just about, you know, how to talk to consumers, how to, you know, make sure they have a frictionless experience to really getting in deep into what their needs are. And especially crucial as we're in a relatively new industry where there's still so many open questions, which I, I love. I'm I'm a problem solver, so I'm just always excited to see, okay, what else do we have to figure out today? And and we're still doing that on a, on a pretty daily basis now. So that's great. What an interesting background for sure. I, did, I don't know if I knew the architecture piece of it. So very cool to see that you've entered the world of CPG um, in that way. So for folks who may not be familiar with Thinks and the brand Thinks. Um, tell us a little bit about the brand. Um, I know it's been around for about 10 years, but give us a little bit of history on Thinks the brand then and now. Yeah, so, you know, I think we were really a disruptor, right, into, uh, you know, the fem care category when we started. We really started really openly talking about periods, right? That was really kind of our, our claim to fame at the beginning. 
And we had such incredible uh, creative teams, marketers who really, really reached out to what consumers wanted to talk about, right? That had been very taboo topics before that we were putting right on the forefront from our subway advertisements to you know, our installations, to our pop-ups, right? The point was to get the conversation out there. And so the brand has really grown from that point, from a period underwear focused brand to now kind of a brand house. So we have our Thanks for All Leaks line for, for bladder incontinence. Um, we have our, you know, masthead brand Thinks uh, for period underwear, but we also have Thinks Teens um, for um, teens um, so and preteens as well. And so there's this amazing portfolio now that meets all of these need states. And now we've really gotten into different price points, right? We also have our lower price point product TFA um, it, that launched in, in major retailers as well. And so we're really trying to make ourselves as accessible as possible. And it's really been incredible because I remember I wasn't early, early on in the process, right? I was a kind of mm -hmm. mid-stage startup, but still the amount of growth that the company has had over the last four years that I've been with the organization has been incredible to becoming hopefully at some point, you know, a household name where folks are associating us with period underwear and, and you know, just in general, reusable underwear for all kinds of leaks, right? We really want to meet all those different life stage and life stage needs. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's incredible. And it's been fun to watch the evolution of the Thinks brand for sure. And I, I know just overall, there's a, a commitment to changing the narrative around menstrual health and bladder leakage when it comes to the category. So talk to me a little bit about, in the group here today, I'm sure everybody's wanting to know, what what's it like when you're creating a whole new category? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think uh, we take it in stride some days where we're like, oh, yeah, that we don't know this particular answer. That's, you know, that's business as usual, you know. Um, I think it's, you know, it's it's exciting, right? You know, there's so many things that we don't understand about our consumer's behavior, things we can learn from other verticals, right? Like disposables, we learn a lot and we, we take a lot of learnings from those spaces as well. But then this is a completely new form factor and category, right? And so there are things that we can't rely on other learnings to, to inform. Um, and it's especially true as you think about our creative, as you think about our product education, that's such a huge part of what we do because we're educating consumers not only on our product, but on the category. And so there's a lot of learnings around, okay, how do we get folks to understand the category, the value of the category, and then get them to be excited about our brand, right? There's all these double clicks into not only getting folks um, understanding what the, the benefits are of, of using a reusable product um, and getting over that first hurdle, um, recognizing that it can meet some of their needs, right? Um, that's really the first hurdle to the hurdle of like, okay, but we're the brand for you. We're we're a disruptor. We're we hear you. We're we are customer focused, right? Um, so these are kind of this this duality, of, right, of our work, which is incredible. So I I think because of that, I've learned so much not just about um, you know apparel, not just about um, you know a functional product like like we have uh, the period underwear and bladder incontinence underwear, but just about you know what those benefits and emotional needs are from our consumers as it relates to to feminine care, as it relates to periods, as it relates to bladder incontinence, and so it's this broader scope of, of viewing the consumer, which has been incredible and and really insightful to to better inform the business on what we should be tackling, right? What questions we should be asking because it's deeper right sometimes as you're in something new because you you really don't know what people need and my boss is famous for quoting is you know when you ask consumers like what they wanted in a car they were just like a faster horse right <laughs> like you know we we they don't know what we want like we don't know exactly what they want they are telling us what uh they want in ways that we might not be able to interpret and so a lot of our job is figuring out okay what's that extra thing that they're looking for from from a brand like us to better understand like how to bring value to them. So it's um yeah, it's an exciting place to be in the industry, I think, because we have the ability to learn so much about our consumers. Um, but it can be challenging too, right? And and some days it's like, okay, I wish it was like I was in something easy where I like I just knew like <laughs> what consumers want. But you know, that that's a beautiful part. Challenging is good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I I understand that uh very much so. Just, you know, having spent the last three years of my career at, at Suzy as well. There's a lot of parallels that you just mentioned also. Um, so let's actually get into some of the methodologies uh, that, that your team is using. And I think, um, you know, we could probably kind of bucket 
some of the methodologies into two different distinct areas of your innovation research that you're you're conducting as well as I know that there's been some renovation as well in terms of you know, updated packaging and that kind of thing. So I guess talk to me a, a little bit about the type of market research methodologies that your team is using as you're starting to go into each one of these phases of research. Yeah, I think innovation was where we really started to, to grow, right, as, as um, both an organization, but also as a department. Um, you know, I, I think it's really being on the cusp of, of what the user needs are, and it really challenged us to figure out the best way to get those answers. And, you know, we did a lot of foundational research um, with our innovation team, just looking at and re questioning again what those needs were, right? What were our users' needs? Um, and we did a lot of research cross-functionally around that. And some involved, you know, with Susie as well, kind of testing those things, testing those concepts. We even did that recently um, with some of our concepts for new products that are coming out next year. Um, and so it's just really like, how do people feel about these elements right like we also we already have a new category but how do people feel about these even newer elements that we're adding to a new category right um and so this it, it adds a level of complexity to the kind of questions we have to ask um and to get into the learnings that we need um around you know how to position the product appropriately um and i think susie has really helped get us to like getting rapid testing going right like it's like we have a question <laughs> And then we can immediately put it out there and test and learn um, in such a really fast fashion, which we were not able to do um, prior to, to onboarding the platform. And it unlocked the ability for us to really quickly iterate. Um, and it's so important for innovation. Like you might have one question that leads to 10 other questions about the user. And we were seeing that growth as we started the process of working with the innovation team and we're like, okay, now we ask like our, our loyal customers what they need. Oh, we figured out this other thing. Okay, now let's quickly ask, you know, and so it was just this iterative process and Susie really blended so well into that process. And we're still in a, in a phase where we have to act quickly, right? Um, the industry is moving quickly, competitors are moving quickly. And so this is so important for us to have a partner, right? That allowed us to meet those needs. Um, and then on the business side or the BAU side, where we're just looking at research uh, around concepts and 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 some of our brand pillars and things like that, it's also been a tremendous unlock because before we weren't as integrated as part of the creative process, but we would always say to our creative team like, hey, like, do you want to ask some consumers like what they think or like, hey, that copy that you're testing wouldn't it be great. And I'll always be in meetings like, yeah, we're not sure which one to choose. I'd be like, oh, we got, <laughs> you know, we have a solution for that. And now it's just such a seamless part of the process. We're building that strategy together. We're building it from insights at first. And that was really a credit um, to bringing on the right partners at the right time. Um, and so over the last year, I've really seen it evolve and we're planning into next year, doing a lot more brand testing, a lot more copy testing, a lot more packaging testing um, to really make sure that when, what we're putting out there, we know what the intent is, we're meeting that intent, we're educating in the way that we assume that we're gonna be educating about the product. Um, and so that's why I say it kind of unlocked this ability to be partners with our cross-functional teams in a way that we could not before. Yeah, no, I, you and I talked about that um, earlier this week as we were just, you know, having some some prep conversations for this. And I think that that was really kind of the big thing that stood out to me is just how this has changed some of the process from a research standpoint and how consumer insights get disseminated across your different stakeholders so that's great to to understand that um so when you think about uh, now you know in the grand scheme of things we've talked about some of the methodologies that you're you're utilizing in this type of research when do you start to think about when quant is a correct methodology and when do you start to bring in the voice of the customer with qualitative how does how does that play into some of the decisions that you make yeah that's it's 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 a wonderful question and it's been a part of kind of conversations i've had with the business as of late um people have gotten really excited about qual right and i think that is a tribute to kind of better understanding of the, what each um, methodology gives you in terms of insight so i can hear a lot of conversations now around oh we should do qual for that or Quant makes sense there because we're asking a broader question where a bigger subsection of users and having that data um, actually be quantitative is useful. 
And I think that's a credit to like really kind of thinking about where each of these methodologies sit to be additive. Um, and so, you know, putting quant in a place where we need a lot more, putting qual in a place where we need actually like statistically significant um, subsection of people, like you, you don't want to put it there, right? And it, you know, you don't want to take insights from there to inform like things like, okay, what's our most popular silhouette and why do people like the fitter? You, you want to take that and look at it from a, a quant perspective. Um, but for questions like, what do people think about, um, you know, their own bodies? What do people think about experiencing bladder leaks? What was their first bladder leak moment, right? These are the kind of questions that inform the kind of creative we do so that we're actually speaking to the customer in a way that they're accustomed to. We're actually showing vignettes or experiences that actually are relevant to them, right? And, and so that qual allows us to speak like the consumer, speak to the consumer, and just be more informed about what their pain points are, what the issues they've experienced. Um, so it makes us much more empathetic as a business as well, because I think sometimes when you look at the numbers, you're like, well, it seems like people really, really love this particular concept over others. But you know, it's a it's a survey, right? People are like going in, they're they're on their own, they're selecting things, right? And you get a lot of learnings that are useful, right? For assortment perspective, for portfolio building, for things like size of prize analysis, market research. Those sides, you know, quant makes sense, even for press, right? Like if we're going and putting out, um, you know, press release, we want to build some amazing stats, right? Quant makes sense there. But really, we've seen the application of qual really sing when we're talking about how we're going to address things with consumers, when we're thinking about the concepts for our brand, um, you know, guidelines next year, we're thinking about what the next asset will look like. Should we show more realistic situations versus non-realistic? And there's an opportunity for quant there, is opportunity for concept, but to get that double click on like, why did it really resonate? Like, why did they believe in it? Why was this so important, you know, to them? We can't do that without the quant research. Yeah. So when you are approaching a new either innovation or or renovation project, do you have like a typical research process that you the team thinks moves through or is it really kind of depending on what's coming out of some of the initial phases of research that then kind of lends itself to where you go from a methodology standpoint next yeah so i'm trying to keep it really free i think because we're such a new category and and also in many ways a new business um i've been trying to be more adaptive right to the environment as opposed to kind of you know having a standard process um, we obviously build learning plans. We we do all the classic research briefs. Yeah. We we do all of the things that um, you know traditional insights teams would do. But I spend a lot of my time just talking to the cross-functional stakeholders. Like, how would you envision using this menu of services that we have available from the research perspective to help you with your work? Um, so I almost see us as it might be my service background that makes me like this, but. You know, I worked in service, I worked, worked in experience, and I would tailor, right, to what the consumers were telling us they needed, what they were looking for from the experience. And I started to do that for our own business, right, and, and creating a menu of services, creating, um, you know, these cross-functional meetings to talk about, like, how do you see research sitting with what you do? How would it be best suited to you? And so it's a seamless process, right, where they're like, oh, yeah, Alice was helping us with this, or Alice's team was helping with this. And now that's become something we do on and on. And slowly but surely, we integrate it into other functions. Um, and that has been its work because everyone's moving so fast. There's so many projects. There's so much going on. To have a regimented kind of guideline for how we do research, it would be very challenging for us to meet the needs of all of the different cross-functional partners. So the most successful way I've done it is just you know, building those briefs together but then also just continuing the conversation, you know, and it, it, it'll pop up in, in wild ways. I just had a meeting just about like some creative concept testing and they were like, can we like ask people like what their first like leak moment was and like, how do we, and I was like, yes, we can actually ask that. Or can we heat map test something? And I was like, absolutely. But like the conversations just come up organically. And then slowly but surely, I think we basically get all that good qual from our business, right? We're like, okay, it seems like most of the, what we're doing now is in this bucket. And then we're doing a lot more here. And then we can build better strategies, better learning plans that really guide the business. So a lot of it has just been like, you know, trying to learn what we need 
um, and really building on the work that our previous director of insights did to do that but just extending it to continue the conversations. And from there, I think we'll just build into a really robust um, team because we've integrated all those insights from, from our consumers now, which is the business, just like we did with our consumers before when we started as, as an experienced team, so. Yeah, and how is, um, has there been anything that's like shifted in a big way since you've kind of stepped into your new role in the past year, just in terms of timelines? Um, I know, you know, in working with brands for, for most of my career, it's been really cool to kind of see, hey, this idea sparked and, you know, but that's a 2027 innovation that we're looking at. Um, and I gotta imagine that things probably operates a little bit differently. So how how has um, your focus in this type of role that you're in today helped just shrink those timelines? And what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we've been able to do, as I mentioned before, things so much faster. Um, mm -hmm. So I think BAU research is just faster now. And now it's just integrated as part of our process. Um, and I think we wouldn't have been able to do that, you know, before onboarding um, a, a tool like Suzy. Um, mm -hmm. But timelines is a tricky thing. <laughs> to your point, we're dealing sometime in this year, last year, sometimes we're like pulling things from the past, right, historical into something that would be in 2027, 2028. And it can be hard to manage all of those needs. Um, but that's where I think I've been trying to come back to a structured learning plan, but also a flexible one where it's like, okay, I have a bucket here of things that I know is gonna be foundational, probably for like the future state of questions that have just popped up in meetings with stakeholders, um, cross-functional meetings. You know, I have that repository of things that I know we're going to need to do work on. But then I leave that room for the ad hoc, right? Because every year it's just like something pops up from, you know, the retail team, from, you know, um, the wherever retailer, Target, Walmart, right? Questions pop up. And so we have to be able to be agile, right? For those needs as well. Um, and so it's that balance, right? I'm still trying to think three years out and like, okay, I have things in my learning plan are about three year growth. But there are things that are just about next year, and then there's still things that are about like this year, right? Where I'm trying to like get those out of the uh, out of the um, the timeline. But yeah, it's a moving target of how best to organize your resources against the needs of the business because you know research exists at all these different touch points, right? Um, and so it has been a challenge. But you know, I think what I've just been remembered is just leave space for iteration, leave space for freedom leave space for conversation, right? Because there's going to be so many questions that pop up that we, we need answers on. Right? Are you finding too that you're you're inserted in a little bit more of these conversations than cross-functionally? I know you kind of touched on that a little bit before, but just how has the, you know, the your interaction with cross-functional stakeholders, has that increased over the last year or so since stepping into this new role? Yeah, I, I think so. I, um, but, you know, I think it's it's also, you know, we had a wonderful director of consumer insights before who did a lot of this foundational work of, of introducing consumer insights as a concept to the business. Um, but I think just the speed and, and effort, it looks effortless sometimes, it's not effortless, right? <laughs> like it's a lot of work that goes into like, but I think people feel less worried about asking us for things. And then because they feel less worried about the burden of how much work it might be for us to pull things or yep. get those insights or do that research, then they're utilizing us more. So I think it's just, when you see, it looks breezy and easy, people are like, oh yeah, can you, do, you know, they, like there's less stress about, you know. And I think that's the nature of also the startup and emerging business, right? Like everyone's like, oh man, I know everyone has like 10 things on their plate right now. Um, and so my goal has really been to, even when I was in experience, was to make it, you know, seem to the customer effortless, right? We wanted it to seem frictionless. We wanted them to feel like it was easy that we had all of their information and we knew exactly what they had purchased and it was, they didn't have to worry. And that's exactly what I wanted to do in this role is to, so people don't worry that it's going to take a long time or that it's a lot of work or that it's costly, right? Um, you know, all these concerns they might have about utilizing us, I've been trying to kind of remove over time. And I think from there, we've gotten more integrated in, into the process. Yeah. 
sounds like you've you've crossed that hump. I've, a lot of companies say that they want to have the consumer at the core, and it yep. seems like you've found a way to really unlock that um, within within the Things brand, which is pretty cool to see. I always like to see that. So, I, mean, I think when you you think about having your consumer at the the core, um, who who is she, um, and how do you use insights and some of the the methodologies to think about not only who she is, um, but then also what resonates with them with that person on shelf yeah yeah and i think it's been a moving target about who our consumer is because our consumer is also a disposable user is also like so many other things uh currently um because we're such a new category um and we had our best consumer personas we did a lot of persona work we looked at like okay she's between this age range and this but this year is really asking those questions about who she actually is. Like what percent of the market does she represent? Um, is she really sustainably focused? Was that our early adopters or is that now? Um, it's really morphed, right? Because we're bringing in even more new consumers than our existing ones, right? And that's the goal of the business as we scale, right? Is to continue to bring in those new users. So a lot of the research has been not against who the Thinks user was, but who is the Thinks user going to become, right? Like who are they like three years from now, right? Who are we trying to get? Um, and, and so it's a different beast when you're talking to new consumers, new to the category, new to the brand. And, and from there, we built, you know, we're starting to understand who she might be, right? Or who they might be, right? There, there's so many, um, you know, this, this kind of, Part of the industry can can go uh, across uh, all these life stages, right? Like in all these different kind of demos, all these different kind of backgrounds, and so it's kind of like an expansive right, group of people where you're like, okay, all women, 25 to 40, you know, that's too big. Um, and so the questions now have been around, you know, what is the core needs, right? Why do people choose reusables? And what can we unlock in that understanding to understand who our target consumer is? And I think we're getting closer to, to understanding who that is. You know, I think really what a tremendous unlock is understanding how people decide on new products. That was kind of, you know, cause we're a new product, right? And we're also, you know, a product that people might not have in their consideration set, right? When you go to a, a grocery store or a drugstore, you're like, okay, I have the brands that I normally use when my flow comes up or when I have the need to refresh my bladder leak items, I'm just going to go to the store. I'm just going to go where I go. Um, and so breaking that journey <laughs> to get into the consideration set. So they're like, okay, let me stop a minute and not necessarily just do what I normally do. Mm -hmm. Unlocking that learning has been so key to understanding who our consumer is. And so really looking at these life stage changes has been crucial to to better understanding and targeting right our products so when someone is going from you know uh perimenopause to menopause when someone's going from pregnancy into being postpartum when someone's going into puberty these are these life stage changes where we know speaking to the consumer speaking about those experiences Will, will lead us into like, you know, brand change, right? Or, or routine change. And so um, that's been really what we've been looking at most from the, the understanding who our consumer is, is, is what these kind of need states are, what these kind of life stage changes are. Um, and, and we're doing a lot more of that now, like, <laughs> like a lot of concept testing around like, okay, what does it mean, right, to have bladder leakage issues? Like, what are, like, the emotional concerns around that? And then from there, also tying into who our best consumer would be as well. So, yeah, lots lots to unpack. And I think consumer persona work is even, speaking to my boss as well, has been, like, something that she has said is one of the most challenging parts about, um, you know, the work that we do, picking mm -hmm. that right segment and going forward and saying, okay, that's who we are. Um, you know, it, it's it's tricky and it's a moving target. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fun though too. I can imagine. <laughs> so yeah. I definitely got that from you. How, yeah. do you. how do you think about then? You know, when it comes to the claims and the packaging, because you know you're you're in retail at this point, um, but you obviously started uh, very heavy online presence. Um, so how do you think about that now, as you've got both an online and uh, in real life? shelf that you're working with yeah i think that's the tricky part is that consistency of messaging 
right? Like you want it to be sticky. Um, so my, uh, the team and, and the business is famous for saying, we want it to like see it 18 times, right? <laughs> like, um, and see it in the same way. And, and so that's where product education is so crucial, uh, thinking about how product ed education sits at each of these touch points. Mm -hmm. I think because we were D2C focused, it was very easy to think about product education and the consumer journey. But now that we're omni-channel, how do you parse, parse down like the most crucial elements of the PE that is needed to educate the consumer into a conversion moment, right? Like, and, and so I think that's been really challenging and where we have tried to help to distill, like what are those key terms? What are those key needs? Those value props that can exist on package, but they can also be reminded at every point, like from marketing to them getting to site to post-purchase, right? Like, you know, what are those key needs that we can use and distill? Mm -hmm. um, and so I've done, you know, we did a lot of journey work. We did a lot of, you know, focus groups asking folks, like, what are those key questions you have if you're hitting these different points to distill into those learnings that could exist at all of these omni-channel points? Because I think the issue is always consistency. With a new product, it's like, if you're seeing something different in terms of value props on the site versus seeing something different on the packaging, that can be jarring and it can erode like brand trust. It can erode trust and in, in security in the product. Um, and so that's been really something that we've been unlocking a lot of, of work in this year is, is really just diving into what are those consistent messages that we need across the touch points? How should we be speaking about it at these different points? And what is like, what about the channel should we be optimizing, right? Because um, something on package might work, but it'd be horribly and buried right <laughs> on the site. So it changes based on the touch points as well. So it's like maintaining that consistency, but recognizing the needs are, are kind of different, right? Depending on what touch point it is as well. So it's a balance, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I know, um, you know, we're, we're talking about consistency here, but earlier this week when you and I were chatting, we talked a lot about authenticity as well. So how does that, how does that come across? Um, and how do you make sure that that comes across both on shelf, online, on the packaging, in your claims? Yeah, I, and I think this is where, um, you know, being a good cross-functional partner has come into play mm -hmm. a lot. We have incredible copy teams, creative teams, brand teams, marketing teams. They're doing incredible work around making sure that what we're doing is authentic, that reaches the consumer, that speaks to them. And we have lots of, you know, different advisors, right? You know, giving us amazing ideas about how to do so. Um, but that's where the research is is really additive, right? Where it's like, okay, we kind of know, we, we know this is a direction we want to go, but we're, we just want to lack a further understanding of why, right? And so I, I do a lot of work even with our, our copy team around, I just want to understand how they think about this concept so I can better write <laughs> something that would seem authentic to them. Um, and, and so I think the, the cross-functional relationships we've built has helped in that process, but I think, you know, we want to also not be a hindrance, right? I think there's this kind of balance between, you know, insights and creative, right? Insights in, in packaging creative, insights in, you know, all these different touch points. And, you know, what we've just tried to do is, is not overshadow, right, with insights and we're like, okay, this is exactly what they want. No, this how do we marry the things that you're already planning with things that would resonate with the consumer? So, and in that way, I think we're building that authenticity, but still keeping our creativity, right? Um, we don't want to, we want to be consumer led, right? But we also want to, you know, be exciting, right? Be different, be, be disruptive. Um, and so not, not everyone's going to tell us exactly what they want. But how can we marry that with with the incredible work the team is already doing? So yeah, it's it's a still a learning curve. We're we're getting that point where it's but we're talking about it, right? And and how to bring in the consumer in, in a in a useful and, and authentic way. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, you know, going back to where we kind of started this conversation, just being a completely new category that crosses apparel as well as you know, menstrual health, bladder leakage, like you have to have that that lens in yeah. there too. So um, just a reminder for folks, uh, there is that question box. So if you have questions for Alice, please feel free. You've already gotten a little bit of love from Joanne, uh, just saying, I love this brand and remember when it first came out. So that's always kind of fun. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so just pop your questions in there, everyone. Uh, what advice would you give to, to the audience that's here today as far as they might just be getting started and, and thinking about how they're going to do some innovation research um, and, you know, 
get started with their claims testing. So what advice would you have for the folks on the line? Yeah, I, I think getting stakeholders into those conversations early on. I think a lot of mistakes I made okay. with assuming that I understood exactly what <laughs> we're looking for. And so now um, the brief build process, even down to you know the final look and feel of the survey, even down to the questions, I loop everyone into. And, and it can be annoying for folks who are like, I don't, you know, surveys are like, you know, it can be yeah. a little bit much, right? It can be an overshare. Um, but you know, you get such incredible insights along the journey of building, you know, the research. Um, and so I just keep pinging, like, okay. We, we did this part and now we're, we're coming back to do a second wave. Like what else do we want to iterate on? Um, and so it's just part of the agile like iterative process is just keeping them involved along the way. Um, what I've noticed is sometimes when it's not successful is when you don't continue to bring the stakeholders in. Um, I've, I've seen that done and, and it can be challenging because you want to just shut it down. You're like, okay, we don't want to go creep. We want to just have, you know, these are the questions you want and we're going to get you the answer. And we just haven't had the the luxury to be able to do that for every project. But in that fact, I've, I've just learned a lot about just keeping it, the conversation open and, and keeping it, you know, keeping some space, right, for change um, throughout the brief building and research process. So, um, yeah, that's kind of been the major <laughs> learning and, and advice, that, you know, in, I'm, I would say I'm new into this part of the business, right? You know, we had our previous director of insights and, you know, that's just what I found to work for me. But I, I know, you know, it does, it will shift and change. Like those those challenges will, will change, but that's been the one I've noticed the most, at least in, in our in our, um, in our our role in, in the organization, so. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think just really, you know, we talk about this a lot in terms of just, how important just nailing that brief is at the, yes. the onset. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense in what, in what you're sharing here. We have started to have a few questions kind of filter yeah. in from the audience. So uh, this one comes from Katie Coate um, and she wants to know for an early stage startup with a very small budget, where do you see the highest return on investment for white space identification for new product ideas? So if you were to think about your learning plan, yeah. and where you get the most bang for your buck um, i think that's the question that katie's asking yeah it's a great question um yeah. I, I think you hit it on the head where we you know we still have our scaling budget right? <laughs> the scaling business right mm -hmm. um and so we can't make those big bets um so i tend not to do major major like research projects that take on our full budget right and i get more bang for my buck on those small projects at the moment and so when I mentioned, like, I'll have one or two of the foundational research that I'm going to spend some of our, our budget on, most of the other is the space for these ad hoc requests because we're just still learning, we're still growing. Um, and so I'm seeing most of the, the, the movement and, and the success now in, in the smaller projects. And we've actually kind of developed a niche, right, within the org because, like, we are small in comparison to the other Kimberly Clark brands. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's it's been a helpful niche to say like, no, we can we can do that because like we have like we can do this quickly, like I can give it to you in 24 hours. Um, so I'm seeing a lot more of the bang for the buck just because we're still emerging. So I would say pick those projects have the most impact, but don't have the most cost, right? And and so that's so we do a lot of like our own consumer research, like reaching out to our own customers, utilizing our own network of users. You get a lot of bang for your buck there, but on top of that, also just picking those really, really um, uh, important or, or or kind of projects that can move the needle, but don't necessarily use your entire budget. <laughs> so it's like it might seem like we're doing a lot more, and sometimes I'm, when mm -hmm. I'm talking to people, I'm like we did this project and this, but it's really just for us to be able to to start growing as a as a part of the business, and for us to kind of be able to be a good partner to to other parts and functions of the business so i would say that that's what i've learned um when you have yeah. a small budget just pick those like really really um important projects but that aren't too costly for that you would wipe out your entire budget for the year yeah yeah that's helpful um all right another question this one from tim oswald uh he wants to know just how things is have they utilized or are you planning to use AI in your work? Yeah, 
<laughs> AI is such a, a major topic now. I feel like, not that I'm, I, I, I don't, I, I love tech. So I, as I mentioned, I was a tech person before and um, I've obviously been following uh, chat GPT and all these other kind of enhancements on how we, we talk to consumers or can talk to consumers now um, with AI. Um, you know, we haven't been able to do any applications in our current work at the moment. Um, I, you know, I think it exists more now on our experience side, less on the research side, but I've been mm -hmm. seeing a lot of fun projects coming out that are using AI. And, and so I'm excited to kind of tackle it. I, I even told a, a recent um, person, another research I was working with, I was like, okay, next year, I'm going to look into this <laughs> and figure out like where this sits in our um in our set of tools, right? Because you know, I really see it as a tool. So, how would this tool benefit our users? And um, you know, I think the applications of being able to do a lot of different IDIs or of being able to do like a large subsection of qual, um, not having to moderate and and kind of use the AI to send out those questions. I think that's exciting. Um, I kind of want to see where that would go. But there hasn't been anything that's jumped out at me yet to say like, oh, I'm really really excited about um, you know using that in our in our tool stack. But I'm sure next year there will be something like super exciting, but okay, we have to try this now. <laughs> so. Yes. Well, uh, Tim, for you, more to come from the Susie side there, um, as it's definitely something that is a, a big focus, um, just as we take a look at what areas of research really can benefit from having that type of, um, you know, tech layered on top of what you're doing from a human standpoint. So lots of good stuff to come there. Um, one last question here, it looks like from Allison McHugh. She wants to just uh, see if you could talk us through examples of things that you test on retail packaging, um, some of the specifics around that. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of what we do is just testing, um, you know, what those value props are, the names, um, any particular, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, value props we want to put on pack. Um, PE, so product education that exists on PAC to make sure it's clear clear to users. Um, so a lot of those elements, and sometimes iconography, right? And so like, what's the best, since we're in a space that's a functional product as well, you know, we have to talk about absorbency. So like, how do we talk about absorbency successfully on PAC? So it's a, it's a, it's a lot that exists on PAC, but there's definitely areas that where you can iterate. Um, and, and so that's where our research is really tied into. It's really looking at the iconography, looking at the product education, looking at the clarity of messaging, looking at the most, um, getting the most bang for our buck for these different elements. So doing the testing around what is the optimal version of this, right? What's the optimal version of the image? What's the optimal version of the iconography? Um, and, so, and so that's where most of our testing has been in the monadic space, right? Looking at different concepts. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I cannot believe this, but we are already out of time. Uh, oh. <laughs> so I've done a few of these. It's been a really, really fun, fun way to spend the last 45 minutes with you. So I just want to thank you, Alice, uh, for joining me today and, and really for giving us such a great window into your role and what you're doing uh, within things. So um, a huge thank you also to everyone who attended, spending your lunch hour with us. Um, if you did like today's program, which I hope you all did, I encourage you to just head to suzy.com, check out our full library of webinars, white papers. There's a ton of content that we put out on a very, very regular basis. Um, so Alice, a huge, huge thank you to you. And I think everyone's clapping virtually. So, <laughs> but with thank that, you so gonna, much, yeah, 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 no, <laughs> for you. sure. I'm going to hand it back over to Jackie, uh, who's, who kicked us off to wrap us up. Thank you so much. Sorry, my technology was taking a minute there. Um, what a great conversation, though, Alice. You were such a pleasure and shared such helpful insights. And all of the questions in the queue just show how engaged the audience was um, with the presentation. So I just want to thank you both again for being here today. As a reminder to those on the line, uh, we will post the replay of this in our resource library to watch on demand. Otherwise, we will let you all go and have a great rest of your week and weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.